Hey guys and welcome back to a new Android video. In this video I have 10 quick tips about UX design for mobile apps specifically. So whether you are an Android developer or a Kmpi developer or even an iOS developer, these quick tips will help you drastically improve the user experience of your Android apps or your mobile apps. And I really want to keep this short because those tips don't require that much explanation, but they can make a huge difference in user experience. And in case you've missed that, on Saturday, May 10th, 3 p.m. UTC time, I will host a free live online workshop about design patterns for Android and KMP developers. Completely free. You can sign up with the first link in this description. Completely interactive also. So you can ask me directly your questions and I will go over these. Coming to UX tip number one, and that is if you have small clickable targets like icons where the user can click on, give them a proper touch target size. So here you can see I have a toolbar in my Android app and on the one end we have a clickable icon, so just a normal icon and an icon button. And making such normal icons clickable is usually not a good idea because icons have a very small size and that way you restrict the clickable bounds to just the icon. And if we hover over this, you can see this, that here we have a very small touch target ratio or touch target size. And you always have to think of users with possibly very uh, thick fingers who aren't that good at hitting exactly this icon. So if we tap a little bit outside, then this won't trigger the icon anymore. However, if we put an icon inside of an icon button to make it clickable, then by default, the touch target size here will be in, um, increased drastically. So especially on Android, if you work with clickable icons, always put these in an icon button. And if you have some kind of custom UI component that is clickable and very small, also manually increase the um, touch target size. Your X tip number two is validate text fields inline after having typed something or after a text field loses focus. So very often I see something like this. We have an email text field. We can enter something here, test something for the password. And if we then click send, it tells us, please enter a valid email. This is very frustrating for the users since they have first type everything in order to then finally, after clicking send, to see that they made a mistake. Instead, it's much better to let the user type something here. And then when the text field loses focus and this is not a valid input, we then validate it because that way we immediately tell the user that something is wrong about the inputs and they have to fix that first before being able to click send. If they then go back in here and say, okay, I changed this to a valid email, then we can also uh, remove this error live again to tell them directly when an email would be considered valid. UX quick tip number three is also here for these text fields and that is to implement IME actions when it makes sense and focus management. So IME actions are those actions that actually appear here for the primary keyboard action. And the default is simply enter. So we make an enter line here. That's typically something we don't want for an email or a password field. So what makes more sense is to override this IME action, which works with compose text fields, for example, to the next action. And if we click this here, then we automatically get to the next text field. So we don't manually have to tap into this text field in order to give it focus, but we can automatically do so and then say, okay, IME action done. Since there are no more text fields, we click check and then our text field automatically hides and we can click send. Coming to tip number four and five together, number four is actually to always have just a single primary action per screen. So the primary action is really what the user is the most likely going to do on a given screen. For example, if we have a simple note, title, description, editing screen here, then the most likely thing a user will do there is to save the note. However, right now we have two primary actions because we have two such solid buttons that are both very, very prominent. And these don't give the user a hint what the, the most likely desired action from them is. So instead, what we typically want to do is we want to make one of those buttons outline to make it a little bit less prominent. So for the cancel button here, we could, for example, say we swap this out with an outline button like this. And then you can see that we suddenly have one primary action and the cancel action is still there, but it's less prominent, which tells the user, hey, saving is probably what you want. Your X tip number five also relates to that. And that is to always keep the primary action as close to the user's thumb as possible. So you must imagine that most people are right-handed people. So they use their right thumb, which is on the right side of the device to actually tap on these primary actions. And if the primary action is somewhere at the top here, then that won't work with the thumb since it's simply not that long. But the same way here, that means that the primary action should not be on the left side of this row, but actually swapped on the right side, since that is closer to the user's thumb. So this would be the proper UI and proper UX. 
And of course, what would make sense is to give this cancel button also some kind of error color to show that this is a possibly destructive action. But when we are already at destructive actions, so when the user does something that possibly deletes an item that discards certain unchanged changes, so something where the user can really lose data if they proceed, then the wording of that dialog really matters. So here I've implemented two cancel buttons that both show different dialogues. And the first one shows the bad example. If we click this, it shows, are you sure this cannot be undone, cancel and confirm. And now my question to you, what happens if we click confirm? Well, you can tell me that because the dialog does not tell you either. And yes, if you show this on some kind of uh, detail screen, for example, just like on the note detail screen from the previous tip, where clicking on cancel would discard the current uh, edited note, then the user would maybe have a little bit of context on that, what happens if they click confirm. But what's much better is if you style the dialogue like this, where the headline clearly says what happens if we choose the primary action of the dialogue. So if we choose the right option in this case, oh, we discard the note. Oh, this cannot be undone. Oh, if I click here, then I will actually discard this. So just, just reading the, the, the discard text here already tells us what would happen if we click it. While if we call this confirm, then that does not yet tell us what happens if we confirm or what we actually would confirm in the first place. And that together with a clear dialogue title, what happens if we confirm, if we discard, that really makes it clear to the user um, whether they want to hit this button or not. Next tip relates to text fields again. And that is if you have some kind of text field in your app that has a requirement to have a certain text length. So let's say you want the user to be able to enter a title and the title can only be 10 characters long at max. Then we can enter this, we can give the user this specific text field. We can say test hello world. If we then click save, it will tell us, oh, okay, the title must consist of 10 characters at most. But that's something the user does not know until they hit save and see that error. However, a better approach would be that once we delete some characters and hit save, so we have valid input, then this text field appears. The better approach would be just showing a character counter because this way we can already tell the user in live, in real time, when the input would not be considered valid. So we can, if we now type something, we say, hello world, they will um, automatically see, okay, um, I actually have a too long text. It shows in red and the save button would also be disabled. So they wouldn't even be able to click the save button in the first place to find out there is an error, but they would instantly and intuitively know, okay, this is how long the text needs to be. So they plan ahead of time to uh, just choose a text that fits these length requirements. UX quick tip number eight, and that is something not inside of our Android app, but whenever you display some kind of color on another color, ask yourself if it has sufficient contrast. And for that, we have those contrast checkers like webaim.org contrast checker, where you can enter the foreground color, so the color of your text, the color of your icon, and the background color where it's displayed. And if you now say, okay, my icon has some kind of color here, for example, this purple, and it's being shown on a white background, then it gives you the contrast ratio. And specifically, it tells you these different categories of uh, contrast, where it would pass or fail. And what this tells you is that here, for this particular color, that there's simply not enough contrast to properly see this on a white background. So there's just a mathematical formula behind that tells you, okay, this would be considered enough contrast for the average users being able to easily recognize this text, also here for different variants like regular and bold, and also for icons, so this icon is definitely easier to see than such a rather thin text. So certain categories passed here, but a lot of them failed. And especially for normal text, you should at least satisfy this first uh, WCAGAA category, which requires a contrast ratio of at least 4.5 to 1. So if we actually make this text a bit darker, you can see how the contrast ratio suddenly rises because the darker the text is on a light background, the better the contrast will be, obviously. You can see there's still another uh, category, the AAA one, which still fails. This is kind of the uh, gold standard for contrast ratios um, and it requires a contrast ratio of, you can see, at least seven, but it is unrealistic to always satisfy this AAA category here with each and every text because this will often clash with uh, designs and requirements. So it's unrealistic to always account for this, but if you have very, very important texts, then it can also make sense to have a contrast that really um, has a contrast ratio above seven to one. And if you're possibly developing an app for an older generation, that also makes more sense to actually think of this requirement. So um, older people who maybe see a little bit worse than younger people um, can still properly recognize such thinner texts. 
And for the last two UX quick tips, I've opened my Echo Journal app again, which is an app that I've just developed and uh, created a completely dedicated course about that will come out soon. In short, it's an audio journaling app and audio journaling where we have to use the user's microphone, of course, requires a runtime permission request. So coming to tip number nine, and that is to defer those runtime permission requests as long as possible and only request that permission when it's really needed. So here at the moment, we are about to make a new voice memo. That is the point where we would get this runtime permission request. But before we actually make such an audio memo, we don't need this runtime permission. So we also don't need to um, request this from the users, for example, immediately when the screen opens. And this also is the advantage that way more users will grant this runtime permission because suddenly in the context, what they've done in the app, it will make sense why the app requests that in the first place. If you request that immediately when the app opens, or also, for example, notification permission, they have no idea why it's requesting that because they might be afraid that your app now spams them with notifications. But if you actually request that the moment they would, for example, sign up for certain information, for certain notifications, for example, if you have uh, some kind of car selling app that, you, that they would get a notification when there is a new car that matches their search criteria, then the moment they are about to set that up, that, then it would make sense for them why they need to also grant this permission. And coming to the last UX tip, which is actually only applicable to Android, which we also have to make a real recording for in this app. So let me request this again. I reinstalled the app in the meantime. Um, but here, if we make a recording, blah, 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 and we then create something for such screens where the user possibly has to enter quite some data in the first place. So it could also be a note-taking app where they create a note with a, with a title, a long description, where the user just has to invest a certain time in order to just get a UI state or get to a UI state that is not yet safe persistently. So here, just quick demo, we say, okay, we have excited as a mood, then we enter a title, we have certain text that we've assigned here. Um, we can add a description, hello world. And if the user then maybe gets a call or so, the app gets, gets minimized, what can happen on Android is that the Android OS says, let's kill the process because the OS is hungry for memory. And the moment this happens, the user can still go back. They will still see it here. But if they go back, then you can see in my case, all the state is restored. But by default, all your states that you have in your app, also view model state, are reset to the default values. So empty title, empty mood, no recorded audio memo in the first place, empty description, empty tags. And this would be really frustrating, especially in such a case where they may have recorded a five minute audio memo about their mood. And just because they did not immediately save it and then get, got back to the app later, all that data would have been lost in the case of process death without the user knowing this mechanism. Luckily, we can work against that. We can restore certain states after process death by using safe state handle in the view model. That's all covered in the course but especially for such screens where the user invests some time to mutate certain values in order to save them in UDB later, make sure to restore the states from process dev. Otherwise, your UX will suffer. Awesome, hope you enjoyed this. As I said, free workshop, first link in this video's description, and I will see you back in the next video. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye-bye.